Okay, so in this video, um, we're going to be talking about the um, how the height of a ball inside of a rotometer relates to the volumetric flow rate inside of the rotometer. So we have a ball here sitting inside of our rotometer, and the and the liquid is pushing the ball up. But so there's lots of different forces that are acting on this ball. We have the flow rate is going up, but then we have the um, force of gravity acting against that. And then um, we also have the buoyant force of the ball. Like it is still, it still will be denser than the liquid, um, but there is still a buoyant force acting on the ball. So we can draw a, um, a uh, free body diagram to um, represent those forces. And one thing to note is for this ball, all of the forces, so notice we have a force one here, which is the liquid or the, the uh, force of the liquid flow rate going up. Um, it, it, it is perfectly perpendicular with the cross section of our, our ball that we have inside of the rotometer. So picture, um, we have this and then we have our cross section right there. And then all, so even though we have forces that are coming in at all directions here, they will sum up to be perpendicular to that cross sectional, uh, area. So we can use that to, um, help us figure out the force that the, um, flow rate is applying on it. And so here's our free body diagram. We have our ball right here. We will have, um, our buoyant force. So we'll have FB going like this. And then, um, we will have a force that is greater than our FB. So this will be our gravitational force. And then we have two more forces that are also acting on this ball. We have, um, our force at one, which is pushing the ball up one that is pushing the ball up. But then we also have our, um, force of our liquid that is actually on top of the ball. So our force at three, so we're going to have our, um, force at one, one, and then we are also going to have our force at three. And so in a rotometer, the ball is staying at a steady state. So it's staying in the same, um, vertical position. It's not moving. So the sum of all of these forces must add up to be zero. Um, so we can break this down into, um, I'm going to break, I'm going to put, I'm going to group the buoyant force and the gravitational force together, and I'm going to group the, um, F1, and F2 together. So first we can find, so force is just F is equal to MA. But we're not going to use this form. We're going to actually break um, the mass into a into density and volume, and then a will just be our um, the acceleration due to gravity. So we'll interchange that for g. So our F B is going to be our row of our ball. No, it'll be the density of the liquid. So our fluid, and then we will have the volume of the ball times G and then the force of gravity is going to be the density of the ball times the volume of the ball times, uh, gravitation or the Acceleration due to gravity. Um, so then we can rewrite this as, so we're going to have 
um, it's going to be F1 minus F3 on the right hand side. And then on this left hand side, it's going to be uh, FB minus FG. And we can um, factor out FB and G. So it'll be um, row F minus. So it will be V, B, and G times uh, density of the fluid minus the density of the ball. And now we can find uh, the right hand side. Um, what is F1, F2, or F3? Okay, so it was actually supposed to be the density of. Um, so it was the gravitational force minus the, um, the buoyant force, and uh, I had these flipped earlier, but this is what it should be. Um, and now we can find F1 and F3. So our F1 and F3 are actually both going to be, um, they're going to be multiplied by the cross-sectional area times the, the pressure that each one applies. So we're going to have, um, so notice this is diameter, so this would be the area, um, use the diameter, and then this will be times P1, and then this will be the same thing except times the pressure at three. And so now we can plug these in and we can factor out um, this term here, because it's the same. Um, so we got V, B, G, times rho G, minus, or not rho G, rho B, sorry. Um, rho F, equal to, we'll have P1 minus P3, times pi B squared, over four. And so another thing is that um, volume, so the volume of our ball can actually be uh, represented um, as um, pi b cubed over six. So we can plug this in for our the volume of our ball and um, notice that pi and pi cancel, d squared, and then it leaves one d left on the left-hand side, and then we can multiply by the four, and then that will give us um, two-thirds dg times rho b minus rho f, which is equal to p1 minus p3. But now we have to deal with these um, P1 and P3. So we have our P1, P2, and P3. Our pressures at position one, two, and three. So um, in this diagram here, everything looks like you know normal size, but in an actual rotometer, everything is super, super tiny, like. The distance between um, the wall here and the, the ball is, you can probably barely even see it with the naked eye. But there's that little space. And so that actually leads me to that next point in that this actually goes a sudden expansion from point two to point three. And so because the diameter of the ball is so small and there's so little space here, the velocity of the fluid right here is going to be going super fast. Whereas right here, um, because it undergoes sun expansion, there's no pressure recovery, like I uh, said in the last video. And meaning um, that the pressures at position two and the pressures at position three are going to be equal to each other. And so um, also we can use 
um, the flow rate, we can use the um, continuity equation um, with, um, we can have the area, cross-sectional area at position one times the velocity at one is going to give us our flow rate at this position, which is not, um, we're trying to find the flow rate and relate it to the height of the ball. And then we can set this equal to cross-sectional area at two, which is very, very small. And um, the cross-sectional area at one and three are essentially going to be the same. Um, but we have this, and because the area differences are going to be so large, um, that's why we will have a very big um, velocity change here. And I am going to erase this portion of it and write down, um, oh, before I do that, um, I never really finished my point. With the pressures two and three being equal to each other, we can substitute in pressure two for this. And after I erase this, and write down Bernoulli's equation, you'll see why that um, substituting our pressure at two um, helps us. So here we have uh, Bernoulli's equation. And another thing that I didn't mention earlier is that the diameter of the whole tube itself is actually gonna be important later. And as, as well as the um, height of our tube but the height of the from position one to position two is again going to be so small that we're essentially just going to call the change in height going to be zero so that's why um, Bernoulli's equation here this term our change in altitude is going to be zero and we're also going to be ignoring frictional heating so that's going to also be zero and then this is um, our density of our fluid, rho f. And then what we can do is we can move this over to this side. And then we can plug in this equation for our numerator here. Um, but I'm going to move it over first. And then also, we're trying to find this term right here. Because that is the flow rate at position 2 or it's not the flow rate, but it's the, the velocity of our liquid at position two, which will help us get the flow rate at position two. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna substitute, we're gonna solve for our V1 here in this equation and substitute in, um, it will be V1 is gonna be equal to A2, V2 over A1. So we're going to substitute this in for our uh, V1, and I'm going to move this over to the other side. So we're going to have V2 squared minus A2 V2 over A1 squared, and that is all over 2. And then that is going to be equal to P1 minus P2 over density of our fluid. And again, the negative got distributed into here, and it, so that's why I was able to flip them. <clears throat> We're trying to solve for this V2 squared here. So we can pull out this uh, V2 here, and we can rewrite this as V2 squared over 2 times it'll be... Um, we're pulling out a v2 squared over a 2, and here we're going to have 1 minus, it'll be a2 over a1, but remember this is still squared, and then this is going to be equal to our p1 minus p2 over rho f. So this term right here is kind of annoying for us to deal with, but there's a easy way of looking at it. So 
Remember how I was talking about right here? We have our the area, the cross sectional area at position two is way, way smaller than our cross sectional area at position one. So that means our numerator is going to be super small and our denominator is going to be super big or in comparison. So the ratio is going to be super, super tiny. And when you square a um, ratio that's already way smaller than one, it just gets even smaller. So what's nice is that we can just take this to be zero. And then um, we can to solve for V2, we can just multiply by two on both sides and uh, square root. So I am going to erase this left-hand side here so I can rewrite the next equation. So we got V2 and be equal to square root of two times P1 minus P2 over F. <clears throat> and so this is our velocity at um, position two. And so notice we can simply just plug this into there, or not this into there. And um, I'm going to rearrange some stuff so that I have room to do that. So now we can go ahead and plug this into um, for here. And so we have a two and then a two here. So that'll be a four inside of our radical. So we can just pull that out. So be two and then we'll have DG times density of the ball minus density of the fluid all over three. And then remember this is square rooted or two to the one half power. And that is our um, velocity of our liquid at position two. So next thing is we're trying to relate our height of the ball to the flow rate. So a um, on a very small scale, a rotometer isn't actually straight up and down like the the, um, the rotometer actually kind of looks like this. We have the ball down here, and the bottom of the rotometer is the minimum it is is the diameter of the ball so that the ball doesn't fall out, and it's actually tapered. But this is so small that you can't even see the taper like when you actually look at it. So we have our diameter here and notice that the diameter actually changes with our, our height. So the higher we go up, the bigger our diameter gets. Um, so how is that important? Because we're trying to relate our height to our flow rate. And one way to get height into our equation somewhere is through this um, um, area here. So when you pick up a rotometer, it's a cylinder that has the ball inside of it. So you have the rotometer and then the ball is very close to its diameter. Um, so we can represent A2, A2 as pi, we want A2 to be this area right here. So we can represent A2 as um, pi to, um, divided by 4 times d squared, so the diameter of our rotometer minus the diameter of our ball. And how does that help us? Because this, um, remember the diameter of our rotometer is actually changing with respect to our uh, height. All right, so now how do we relate our diameter to 
our height. Um, so how we do that is, so notice that this um, taper here is a straight line. So um, there actually is a slope to um, this rotimeter here, this uh, wall. So what we can do is essentially just write a um, classic y equals mx plus b uh, formula. So earlier how I said the minimum diameter at the bottom is going to be the diameter of our ball. So it'll be little d. And so we're trying to find this um, the diameter of the tube or the rotometer. So we're going to have d is equal to this will essentially be our, our b or our y-intercept. So we'll have d plus then we'll have m as our slope. This will be the slope as to which this tapers, and then times our x or our uh, h. And so what we can do is we can actually plug this into um, this d squared here. Um, so I'm just going to um, factor this out here. So it'll be d squared plus 2mh plus m squared h squared. So this is what this term will be inside of this equation here. This is actually supposed to be, um, I forgot this d here, so it'll be d m h. So now let's look at it before we plug it into here. So this d squared and this d squared will actually cancel. And another thing is that this term right here, the slope, if you look up rotometers, it'll like tell you the, the taper angle. Um, this slope here is going to be super, super small. So, and how I said earlier, when you take a super small number and you square it, it gets even smaller. So we're just going to take this term as um, zero. What this is, when we plug this into here, we essentially just found our A2. And notice up here earlier, we already found our uh, V2. So now we just have to plug it in and um, move it around algebraically. So our A2 was, so pi, and then this two here would cancel with that four that was here. So it would be uh, pi over two, um, d m h. And now we can find our q or this term. So q um, is going to be equal to, um, it'll be this term times this term. So we see that there's a two here and a two here. So these two can cancel. So we will have a pi um, dm. I'm going to write h at the end here because that's what we're trying to relate it to. And then this is times, this is all in a uh, radical. So I have dg. Density of the ball minus density of the fluid over three. And then this is all multiplied by our H. So this is the equation to relate the flow rate to the height of a ball inside of the uh, rotimeter.